give the Lord a big hand clap. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God, church. Father in heaven, we thank you because you are a good God. And we bless your holy name because you have gathered us here to praise your name. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. And we thank you, King of Glory, because you are in our presence. We thank you because you are in our midst. We thank you, Lord, you deserve all the honor and glory. And as we lift your name up high in songs and singing, will you receive the worship that you are due, that you deserve, Lord. We bless your name. Be with us here this morning, Lord. Connect with us, King of glory. Speak to us and let your word, Lord, enrich us and bless us with everything in us. Let the name of the Lord be praised. Someone give the Lord a big hand clap today. Praise the name of Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Before you sit down, find three, four, five people and tell them welcome in the house of the Lord. As some of you are seated on one side and haven't moved at all, go around and meet five. Tell them your name and tell them what. Ask them their name if they don't know you. Tell them welcome, welcome in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. them where they come from, meet everybody on one side or on the other side and bless the name of Jesus. Praise, we praise you. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. We praise your name. We praise the name of Jesus. Come on, lift your hands and praise the name of the Lord. in the presence of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. If you have a child who's probably 10 and between 5 and 10, you can, uh, the teacher Martin walked out, you can help them uh, go to their class. Thank you for being with us. And whenever you come to church, keep them here until we are done with praise and worship then they can walk out and go with their teachers. It helps us a lot. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. And then the youth uh, also have a class going on, so you know where you're going. And then after church, they have a program going on. Uh, Some kids, you might have to help them get where they need to go. It's just outside here through the fellowship hall. Thank the Lord for AJ. Come on, give him a big hand clap. Praise the Lord. Uh, This guy prays, uh, does different voices by himself. I don't know how he does that. You feel like 10 people are singing, and I don't know how he does that. But good to see you in the house of the Lord, everybody. God bless you so much for being here. Now, so many of you, uh, you've scattered and you're far away from me, and I feel I'm only with two people here. Uh, I, I don't know what's going on. Praise the Lord. Dr. Captain, this used to be your seat. Come back. Come back to your seat. Uh, Miss Mary, come back to your seat. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to fill this place with a few more chairs. So I want to have you here close to me so that I don't feel alone. You know, I'm, I'm far away from you and you, you'll make me feel like uh, I'm speaking to only four people. Praise the Lord. So we'll have more chairs here. So all of you, when you come to church, come and sit here close. If you feel, be closer. Hallelujah. If you didn't, you're scattered, then you're going to make me a, I'm looking for an amen from far away, hallelujah, but I need it here close to me. Praise God. But we're glad and excited to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, no need for introduction. My name is Naziri. All of you know me, praise the Lord. Uh, my wife is seated over there, praise God. <laughs> give, give the Lord a big hand clap today. I t- uh, t- 
I tell Dr. Luke all the time, one of these Sundays, I'm going to come and tell you my wife is sitting over there. Because he, he says his wife has been there 40-something years. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise God. Uh, but uh, it's been a blessing. Don't ask me how it is going. It's not going yet. Hallelujah. It's only been three weeks. Some people call you after one and say, how is marriage going? I say, no, no, no. The thing hasn't even started. Can you give me, give me, give me some time? It started already. <laughs> I said, I said, wait at least, give me four months and then call me. So please, leave her alone, okay? Just bless her. Let her have a cup of tea. <laughs> but if you notice though, you can tell that I'm different. Don't you tell? A little bit, hallelujah. Yeah, I look, I look uh, more handsome. Uh, I, if you see me walking these days, I walk very calmly. I walk very nicely. I don't. I, I, if you see me, if you see me talking, I talk very nicely. I talk very well. Uh, my wallet is doing okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So thank God for all of that. It's been a blessing. Hallelujah. Uh, last two, I think two weeks ago, Pastor and Doctor Luke were sharing with us about serving in church. <clears throat> And using our gifts, and uh, I wanted to continue in the same way, but going a little bit backwards on if we come to use our gifts and serve in church with an understanding that you and me know what church really is. Hallelujah. What is church, honestly? So I'll be dealing with that for the next two or three weeks. Uh, I feel like if we understand the reason for something, then our commitment to it changes. Is that, is that a, a, a correct statement? If you understand perspective and relationship, then how you respond to something totally changes. Someone might say, oh, I didn't know, but now I know. If someone does something to someone and say, why does he go an extra mile to do these things to this person? You're like, oh, they are related in some way. So relationships, understanding, changes the way we respond to things. So if someone comes and says, you need to serve in church, you need to give in church, if you don't have no relationship with the church they are talking about, then why should I give? So an understanding backwards of what church should be, uh, what church is, the traditions of a church, the background, the origins of a church, that can help us be able then to commit to the things we are being taught in a church setting. If you ask anybody what church means, you get different images. Praise God. Each one of us defines church differently. Uh, <clears throat> if you wake up in the morning and say, we are going to church, people are coming to this building. Hallelujah. So someone is coming to church. Someone says, we are building a church in Nairobi. That means talking about a building. They are building a church. If you ask another person, what is church to you? They say, what church do you go to? They say, me, I go to the Roman Catholic Church. So to them, church is a denomination. It's not a building. Uh, I don't know if you've heard young people these days, they say, Mimi mambo ya kanisa hii, Have you heard that word these days? What are they meaning? They're meaning church and institution. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're Baptist, whether you're Catholic, whether you're, they say, all of you church people, uh, me, <laughs> they say, I love God, but church, uh-uh, I don't want to deal with church. It's, it's a big statement these days. So that person is not talking about church, the building or the denomination. That person, in his mind, church is an institution and it's everywhere. Uh, it's whether you're Baptist, whether you whatever it is, you're all that. Uh, to some of us, it is a worship service that we come to on Sunday morning. Uh, if I tell Posse, are you coming to church next week on Sunday? And he says yes. And then he comes and goes across to the other church building there. Has he gone to church? Yeah. But to me, I'll call him and say, Post, you didn't come to church. Didn't you? So me, my understanding of church then in that moment is different. If I wake up and tell my wife, ha, I'm going to say that word a lot in today's service, so just be ready for it. Uh, if I wake up to somebody, are you going to church? And she says yes. And then she goes to the living room and turns on YouTube and watches UBC online. She's doing church. Then me, I'll say, See, you said you're going to church. You're supposed to go somewhere. So our images of what church really is, is very, very, very different. I don't know where you fall or belong. Uh, I don't know, uh, Zipporah, if you wake up in the morning and tell your kids we are going to church, 
and then you walk across to the neighboring church, what would they say? They would say, Mom, it is not church. Isn't you? <laughs> but you've gone to church, maybe first Baptist, uh, whatever it is. That is how each of Now, all these denomination, uh, institution, a place of worship, a church building, all define church, but they are not adequate. They do not give us a clear picture. They are part of, that's why we gather, and that's how we will conclude understanding our role as a congregation, but they are very insufficient in teaching us what church really means. So all of them are together combined, and then we add on a few, they'll help us understand. Thank you for being here. If you have a child, uh, five and ten, there's a service, but they are below five. Uh, we are preparing their classes, so please bear with us for maybe a few more weeks. Uh, you can stay with them. If you need their place to rest, you can go outside here and just go inside the glass door. You'll still be able to listen and watch very well. The door is on that side. Dr. Luke can show you if you need help. Uh, but in a few weeks, the nursery will be ready on that side. So feel free to always park on the side and uh, be there. I love, I'm, I've been working with children for a long time. So everywhere I am, my eyes are always looking at kids. So when I see a child everywhere, I, I want to tell someone what to do. <laughs> so bear with us for a few minutes. In Acts chapter 8, uh, the Bible says that on that day, I don't know if they have it, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea. The church in Jerusalem was a local body. Every gathering in Jerusalem. So here, the writer uh, of the book of Acts, Dr. Luke, is calling the church in Jerusalem uh, a local body. Uh, when, Paul, when Paul is uh, greeting people in his letters, in Romans chapter 16, verse 5, he says, Greet for me the church that meets at your house. Paul here is talking about a small meeting of people that would meet at a house. Hallelujah. So the church, a local body in Jerusalem, here the church is meeting in a house. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, he says, And God has placed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, people who do miracle signs and wonders with gifts of healing, helping, guidance, and all different kinds. Here, it is a body of believers. It doesn't matter what local congregation you go to, but there's a prophet, there's an apostle. This is different from the one that meets at the house and the one that is a local one. Then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Now here, the church is the body of Christ. Regardless of where someone is, it is going everywhere. Hallelujah. If you study the word church, if you begin with it, most of us think that church began in Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. Correct, a little bit, but it has a few words back that help us understand what that is. If you see the word church in the New Testament, if you're reading from Matthew to Revelation, and you see the word church, the word church, we get it from the word ecclesia, which means a gathering or an assembly of people. Any assembly of people that meets would be called an ecclesia, and that's how we get the word church. They meet, they assemble, this gathering of people are doing something. What they do is what we are going to learn here today. In the Old Testament, the word church meant something else. Two words. One meant an assembly of God's people specifically, and the other one meant God's house. So if you talked about church in the Bible, depending on where you find it, it will have a different meaning. What would Christ call the church himself? Now, I'm using this one, me and you understanding that Christ is the head of the church. Now, if we are talking about church, I'm jumping ahead of myself to tell you Christ is the head of the church. How did we get there? I'm going to begin from that point today with you and me understanding that Christ is the head of the church. But there's a bigger understanding of how then does Christ become the head of the church. But for the sake of today's start, let us start from there. If he's the head of the church, how would he have church defined? How would Christ have us define the word church? In Matthew chapter 16, actually in the New Testament, Jesus mentions the word church first. 
No one has mentioned the word church in the New Testament at this point. Jesus himself says it first. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew, 16, verse, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 16 verse 18, he has a conversation with Peter. Who do people say I am? Peter replies, some people say Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. He says, but who do you say I am? Peter, he says, thou art Jesus, the son of the living God. He says, a flesh and blade has not revealed this to you, but upon this rock I will build my church. What is that church that Christ is talking about? He mentions the word church for the first time. No one else has said the word church. So did Jesus come to start a community? Did he come to start a gathering of believers? an institution or a denomination, according to his word here. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, Jesus uses the word church again for the second time. Here he says, if a brother, you have a problem with a brother, some things are not going well, he's refusing to repent. He says, report him to the church elders. If they refuse to listen, verse 17, tell it to the church. Now, in this context, then it becomes a local what? A local body. Because are you going to, who are you going to report the brother to? So Jesus is telling us and he's showing us the different ways how he's defining church. He didn't mean a building. He didn't mean a service or a group. He didn't mean a denomination. But all these again define the word church. So there's a very, there's a hard word I wrote down here. Multiplicity. Very different images and concepts that contribute to the understanding of the nature of the church. This is one person's definition of the word church. A place of mutual forgiveness and mutual concern. A place where members give priority to each other's needs. And then he says, a fellowship of loving concern. That's how someone defined the word church. Do you hear his words? He says, a place of mutual forgiveness and mutual concern. A place where members give priority to one another's needs. A fellowship of loving concern. Now, when I was studying, I said, okay, if Christ is the head of the church, at the end of his ministry, he gives a command to this group of people in Matthew 28. He says, guys, verse 19 and 20, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize these people in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end. So Jesus says, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And then at the end of the ministry, he says, you guys go and do these three things. Baptize people, teach them, and disciple them. So to me, a church is a place where we go and there's teaching, there's discipleship, and there's baptizing people. As he commanded. That's how I can summarize my own understanding. Anywhere you go, and they are teaching people, and I think we are getting good teaching in this house, amen? Teaching people, discipling them, baptizing them, as he commands, I call that place what? Church. Praise God. So if you go anywhere, and there's baptism, there's discipleship, there's teaching, we have church. Now, AJ will say, no, 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 brother, you're missing something. What about raising up our hands and singing songs and praising the Lord and bowing down and all that? That is also coming. But I picked those three first. Let me now step back and begin with the origin. How do we get where we are as we are gathered here today? The relationship I have here with all of you is Christ, number one. If I didn't give my life to Christ, I don't know if we would have met uh, Dr. Sang. Would we have met, maybe in Entebbe, we would have crossed by at your workplace, but you know, <laughs> the connection we've had over the years here is because of what? Christ has brought us together. I don't know if I would ever meet you. Maybe somewhere. Our relationship, maybe, <laughs> I assume we had met on a business gone wrong. <laughs> some, some people, that's how they meet. You meet. The first time you meet someone, it was a wrong deal. Eh? Avreja, me and you, our relationship, because we met here, Christ, praise the Lord. And that sets a different. Now, Christ and you and me as the church, if we go back, God in the Old Testament had a group of people called the Israelites. Had a covenant with them. Had a relationship with them. And now we are going to see this word. Now, in the New Testament, the word church 
is used as the people who are called out. In the Old Testament, when God is calling his people out of Israel, they call them the what? The called out. So there's a relationship from the Old Testament between God and a group of people and a relationship between me or a group of people here between us and Christ. So the church, its meaning and its importance has its origin way back when God calls Abraham and his son and his son and his 12 grandchildren into the community. So when Jesus starts a community in Matthew 16, 18, we see that God had already started this community by calling Abraham. So church, there's God, there's a group of people, it's a community, and then in between there lies responsibility and commitment. So when we go to church, what do we do? Hallelujah. What do we do? We raise our hands and sing, we give, we baptize, we teach, we disciple. So we have a group of people, and these people have a special relationship with God. Jesus and his disciples, and then in Matthew 28, he gives them a responsibility. God, Yahweh and Israel, he has a special relationship with his people, and he gives them a responsibility. Actually, he, he keeps his side of the commitment. He was always faithful to them. Even when they sinned, he kept his side of the responsibility. He kept his covenant. So if you're here, these are things I would like you to note down. Christ is the head of the church to which I belong, number one. Number two, church, a community or a group of people. Number three, in that community, there's teaching, there's baptizing, and there's discipling of believers. Number four, in that community, there's a covenant between God and that community or group of people. And then number five, there is a responsibility for that group of people or that assembly. I will say those words again, and I think there now I will have finished my introduction. Someone say, if that is just the introduction, how long is this guy going to talk? <laughs> Let's do the introduction again. Christ is the head of the church. Write that one down. To which I belong. Number two, that church, it's a community or a group of people, which he says, I will build this upon my, I will build my church upon the rock. Number three, in that community or group of people, there's teaching, there's baptizing, and then there's discipling of believers. Number four, that group of people has a covenant between them and God. That's where we are going now with our series of teaching, serving, and all that. Number five, the last one, there's a responsibility on the group of people who are in a church. Praise God. So when Pastor and Dr. Luke are sharing how to serve and give in church, I want us to have this background understanding of how you get connected to a church. And then you'll be able to appreciate now your responsibility. Understanding the origin and relationship is very important before assigning responsibility. If you assign responsibility to someone without them having an understanding of the relationship, that why most of you tell your kids, we are going to visit auntie so-and-so. Dad, why are we going to visit him? Why don't we go home? Then to you, you try to explain to him, you know, that person, when I arrived in America, he bought me the first car. Okay, that then we can go. He has understood now your origin of why you want to go to that person. Hallelujah. <laughs> Before they ask you another question, they help you. You go by yourself. Me, I want to go. Home. I want to go home. But understanding this helps us. And then I want you to be know that you're part of this big thing. It's bigger than a building. It's bigger than a denomination. It's bigger than an institute. It's bigger than just a local congregation. It's a community of believers. Christ is the head. There's teaching, good teaching discipleship, people are being baptized, we do Holy Communion, we care for one another, we do so much more in a church setting. Very different from what you heard this morning when you came to church. Hallelujah! Do you imagine people can have an array of understanding when it comes to church? Praise God. Okay, now, you can have church anywhere. Praise God. You can have church anywhere. But it is a place where we go. 
Now, you could wake up in your bedroom and have church. You could be in a hospital bed and have church. You could be in your living room and have church. We come here and gather and have church. What's the difference? Why do we leave then our homes and come here? Why? Why don't we do church wherever we find? It is a place. You can have church anywhere. It can be anywhere. But the common word in there, it is a place where we go. Some of us wake up and say, I have a separate room in my place where I go to worship God. It is a place where we go. We are going to learn something about the first place where church happens in Genesis chapter 28. And we are going to begin from verse 10. Uh, Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go slowly uh, and see this place that had church. And you're going to be surprised that nothing we have a set up church for was present in that place. Verse 10. Jacob left Bathsheba and set out for Haran. Now, his, if you've been, if you know familiar with the story, Jacob has finished lying to his father Isaac and stolen the blessing. He's been blessed with his mother. They connived, talked to Isaac. They said, this is Esau. I need the blessing. I've brought for you the soup. And then they dress with some hairy stuff. The father touches him and says, are you really Esau? He says, yes, I am, but he's lying. He gives him the blessing. And once Esau comes in, he finds out that Jacob again for the second time has taken the blessing from him. He's looking for him to kill him. And then Jacob starts running away. Verse 10, so he leaves Bathsheba and he runs as far as Haran. Haran is at the top. When God called Abraham, he came with his father, if you remember the story. His father stopped at Haran. He didn't come all the way down to the land of the promise. So it is very, very far away. Now, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. He took a stone and put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw stairways resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above, the Lord spoke. Now, this portion of scripture also appears in John chapter 1 in the New Testament. Uh, when God, Jesus called Nathaniel and his brother Philip, they come to him and say, hey, calls him his name. He says, how did you know my name? Jesus tells him, hey, are you surprised that I know your name? Wait, from now on you're going to see heaven open up, angels descending and ascending up. This is imagery or image showing, but this story appears again. So there must be a connection between here and John chapter 1. God speaks in verse 13. There above it stood, the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of your, of your father Isaac. I'll give you and your descendants the land on which you are lay, lying today. Verse 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. All people on the earth will be blessed through you and your offsprings. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Let me finish it all, then I'll come back. Verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I am not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, God, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, and he set up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it, called the place Bethel, though the city had been called loose. Verse 20, he made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and I will give him, and he'll give me food and to eat and clothes to wear. I will return and I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up here as a pillar of God's house and all of that I have, I will give him a tenth. He makes a commitment. So there are three things happening in this place that I want to share with you about what church is at the first, at the beginning. Hallelujah. So this young man is running. Verse 12, he had a dream in which he saw stairways resting on the earth. And stopped. Verse 12, yes. And he lay down and he had a dream there, angels descending up 
from heaven and above it the Lord stood. So this is what I want you to write down for me first. Church, here, Jacob has a connection with God. Praise God. So if you're learning today, number one, in church, we have a connection with God. Point number one, connection. We come, when we go to church, what happens there? We connect with, we connect with God. Very important. I want to teach. When you teach kids, they teach you how to teach. Before you begin, they ask you, Mr. Naz, when is this going to be over? <laughs> as I haven't started. <laughs> as soon as you speak for two minutes, they're like, can we do something else? So if you're teaching kids, you have to have the point quick and out clear. Because in two minutes, they'll be gone. And it helps you when you're teaching adults. You tell them, point number one, connection. When we go to church, what do we do? We connect with God. AJ sets up the environment, but he's not the connection. Praise God. When he goes, this was a very dry place. No water, no nothing. And there was a connection between a man and God. When you come to church, make a connection with God. Members, praise the Lord. We set up an environment. We, it is, this has nothing to do with you connecting with God. Even in the most boring sermon, in the most boring praise and worship, God is there. Even in your home, as you are alone, make a connection with God. When you say, I've had a connection with God, then we, Naziri says, you've had church. Praise God. I've had a connection with God. Jesus tells the same story in John chapter 1. He says, you will see heaven open, the Son of Man, angels descending up and down, and the Son of Man holding it. Wherever we have a connection, we don't come here to entertain, you know, to put on a show and then pump you up so that you praise the Lord. No, 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 we don't come to do that. We set an environment for you to have a connection with God. So it doesn't matter who's preaching, who's singing, what instrument is being played. Uh, my grandfather used to go to a place, it was a tree. They went to an Anglican church and they played hands and drums. There, there was connection with God. Praise God. And a tree. They had no building. They, they were collecting the money for the building for 20 years. <laughs> they were collecting the money for the, there was a building fund. After, I think I was around 10, they poured the first strip of the blocks. <laughs> then, then I think I left and they had nothing had happened. I, I, I want to go back and find out whether the thing was beautiful. <laughs> but in that place, my grandfather and his members, they connected with God. And you even had to carry your own chair to go to church. So we were leaving home, I carried a chair, the bench. That's where me and him and a few friends are going to sit. So I put it on my head and we walk. It's, a, it's quite a walking distance. But they were going to connect to God. And when we get there, they put the drums the drums, and they sing their hymns, and they have a bishop, and they know, very organized, very organized. If the wind comes, if the sun comes, we move with the sun. The tree, the shade. So make sure you time the, <laughs> make sure you time the sun, <laughs> so you have to go around with the sun. But it was beautiful. Make sure you make a connection. Regardless of what you found in a church, it is up to you to make a connection with, because listen, Jacob, Jump down and see what Jacob says in verse 16. When he awoke, what did he say? Verse 16. Surely the Lord is what? In this place. And I was not. So that doesn't mean the Lord is here now. The Lord was. He was not aware when he got there. He said, I was not. That's a past tense. That means when he got there, the Lord was there. But he did not what? Notice, that's not what we do. We come to church and we don't do anything. Doesn't mean the Lord is not there. The Lord was there. So in church, the Lord is there. When you come, this guy says, man, I did not notice that the Lord was there. I pray that's not you. But when you come to church, you say, Shh, the Lord is here and I'm aware of it. Now you're aware because of the teaching. But how pleasant would it be for you to be in a place and say, oh, I feel the Lord is in this place. Now, you don't have to have a feeling just from this teaching, you know, when we say we are meeting together, 
the Lord is there. He says, where two or three are gathered, I am what? I am in their midst already. So church, we make a connection when we go to church. Please, please, this is your responsibility. Whether the cameras die, whether the things there die, whether the people at home, whether you stop watching us, you still, it's a place and a commitment that me, I say, I am going to make a connection with God today. Regardless of what's going on. If God is okay, let me take the kids to Sunday school, but I'm going to raise up my hands today. And Lord knows whatever I've been going through the whole week. Today I just want to make a connection with God. Praise the Lord. Some of us work Monday through Saturday and beat, things beat you out there. Isn't you? Come tired. Go home and then you have to cook the kids and then you have to prepare family and then you are... People are calling you from Kenya. They need this, we need that. Life is tough. Life is hard. You do all this going on. So Sunday morning, say, no, 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 I want to go and make a connection with. Set. Say, God, these are my tears. These are the things I'm going through. Uh, some of you don't know. I was raised by a single mother. So when you see her come to church, she's bringing a big Lord. Hmm? Including me, I'm the Lord, because through the whole week, I'm the one giving the trouble. (laughs) So someone is bringing a big load on Sunday morning. That's why if you're an usher, you know, when someone is coming in those doors, I don't know where our ushers are, when they went with COVID, please, we need some of you to come back and serve. But we open those doors, our doors are heavy. The lady's mother walks through peacefully and come and stand and I want to make a connection with you. If you're an usher, don't make it even hard. Some ushers are. You don't smile to the people walking in and you even make it hard on them. Please, give a smile. Eh? You don't know what someone has come through with. So encourage. When you see someone at church, praising, praise, give them, make the atmosphere for them what? Because each one of us has come here with a lot. And we want to do it. Give it all back to God. I don't know. Maybe some of you have no problems, but I would use uh, some peace from the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, this morning, I want to make a connection with you. And as the songs come in and they give us an atmosphere, the someone comes in, the encouragement, the fellowship when we are eating outside there, but the lifting of your hands and saying, Lord, I have come to make a connection because I know you are here. After the connection, write for me the second word. Verse 13. There above, Verse 13, if you have it, stood the Lord, and he says, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and I'll give you your descendants, the land in which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Number two, after connection, there is conversation. Like that one for me. After you've had a connection, number two, in church we have a conversation. Praise God. And a conversation is between you and, and God. And God can speak to you in any way he wants. You can speak to him in any way. You make sure wherever you are with God. So we said it's a place. It's a community. But what happens there? We have conversations with God. Sometimes we do corporate prayer and we pray. But you as a pastor, make sure you go to a place and have a conversation with? Okay. When we come to church, when was the last time you've come and you've had a conversation with God in the pews where you're seated? During praise and worship, you know, some people just clap their hands and look around and look. The projector today is not working. Wow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Where's my tithe going? <laughs> okay. There's one person on the camera. How come that camera has nobody on it? No, no, no. It's a place where you have a conversation with God. Conversation. Talk to, by yourself. Now, this is a dry place, and the symbolism is what I'm using. There's nothing good here. At the end of the verse, you'll understand the place was not called Bethel. It was called Luz. Very dry. Nothing good happening there. And God had a conversation with Jacob. Now, you do church in your house, in your home, at work, anywhere. God will have a conversation with you. Some of you have prayer requests that you make to God. And he will answer you. He will say, good. 
that's a good one. He'll say, no, 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 whatever you're praying for, this is not the time. He'll say, no, you're, you're going this way, turn this way. Those are conversations God gives, God gives us in church at a place where we worship him. So, number one, make sure when you go to church, you connect with God. Number three, please. Number two, make sure you have a conversation. In this place, you can talk and lift up your hand and say, God, pour out your heart to him. In your car, you can talk to him. But also, you start learning how to open up your ears to hear from him. Uh, when we were growing up, they teach us, as you read and study the word of God, he's talking to you. He's teaching you. But mostly through our prayer requests and what God tells us, he's telling us, okay, A, B, C. And if you're very keen, he is talking to you. Verse 15, he says, I am with you and I'll watch over you and I'll bring you back here in this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. This is God saying, this brother is running away after lying and cheating and stealing. He says, my commitment and my promise as God has nothing to do with what you've done. It will come to pass. This is God's promise. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. Then remember, the word church in the Old Testament meant what? House of God, the Lord's house. So he called his house. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel. So the city used to be called Luz. Bethel means house of the Lord. Beth, whenever you see the word Beth, is house. Now the word that follows that tells you what that house is. Bethel, house of God. Bethlehem, house of bread. Bethesda, house of mercy. Whatever you see, Beth, Beth, Beth. He calls that place Beth, a place, a house. El, house of God. He calls it. But before he called it then, it was not. Now, if you read earlier on in uh, Genesis, you will see that Abraham called this place, reached at a place called Bethel. But no, 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 no. Don't be confused. So here is the first time he's calling the place Bethel. It was called Luz. Originally, when you read earlier, you'll see that also Abraham called it Bethel. Then you say, oh, why are you confusing us? The writer of Genesis is one person. So wherever he's going to find this place, he's going to call it what? Bethel. Whether it's at the beginning or at the end, it doesn't matter. But here, from Luz, a dry place, this Jacob young man says, this shall be Bethel, the house of the Lord. What has happened in this house of God? I have had a connection with God. I have had a conversation with God. This is the same place Jacob is going to meet God and wrestle with him in a few chapters later when he's returning home to meet his brother Esau. At the same place, he comes and meets God again later in Genesis 20. Uh, in Genesis 31 and 32. Hallelujah. So number one, we make a connection. Number two, we have a conversation at the Lord's place. If he calls it Beth or the house of God, if you wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to the house of the Lord, what happened at the house of the Lord? There was one man and God. There was no instruments. There was no church building. There was nothing. And he had a connection and he had a conversation. with him. So you can do that. Praise the Lord. So we don't have to preach anymore, Cindy. You're going to come, man. Talk. Have a conversation with him. Praise God. That's the origin of the word church. Okay. Number three, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow and he says, If God will be with me and he will watch over me on this journey that I'm taking, running to Laban, uh, his uh, uncle is going there. <laughs> I saw a preacher say he had also been promised by his mother go to your uncle Eben he has beautiful daughters so your young man wasn't only running from his brother he also had a promise ahead of him <laughs> because he says on this journey he's praise if God really watches over me and I take this and he gives me food and clothes when I return safely to my father's household then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar 
will be God's house. And all of that you give me, Lord, I'll do what? Read, read it for me very well. I'll do what? I'll give a tenth. Number three, write this one for me. Church, at a place where we worship God, there's commitment. We make a commitment. We make a what? A commitment. Now, we say of all the commitments in the world, why does money come first? Why didn't he say, I'll commit to sweeping the church? I'll commit to teaching Sunday school. Very, very important. If actually you want to teach Sunday school, it's the best. We've been teaching it for a long, long time. Martin just left the kids, Dr. Sang, and some of, so many of you have helped me, Mercy. Very well, you can commit to any of those. But, this guy says, I'll commit to do well. Giving a tenth of all the commitments, he jumps and he goes to this one. His grandfather had done it, Abraham. Because where your treasure is, is what? Where your heart is? There. But whenever we talk about church and giving, Forget the antics we put up and try to dramatize everything. At the house of God, where this young man connects with God, communicates with God, number three does what? Makes a commitment to God. Because I want now my heart to be here. I'm going to give a tenth of what I get. Where your treasure is, your heart is. So yeah, most people that are really committed in a church are those that have committed first of all what? Financially, I give to this church. I love this church. It's my place. And I want to see it succeed and I want to be there. Most people serving in church, doing the cleaning and the teaching and the Sunday school, are the same people that even I give giving financially, saying in the worship team. Same, because they are already invested financially. They're already invested with their pockets. And that's how it comes to the place of like, if I'm going to the house of God, I'm going to make a commitment. And then that's where Dr. Luke starts last week and says, serving the house of the Lord. Pastor, the other week before, using your spiritual gifts. Those are commitments now we make after understanding that, oh, I'm in the house of God. And in the house of God, I talk to him, I connect with him, and I make a commitment. Praise God. Now, if you understand this, then coming to the commitment part should be natural and easy. Cindy, I've come to the house of the Lord. What can I do? Because it is a place where we connect with God. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of what news you're hearing or stories, whatever, there's, every church has its own issues. Whatever is going on, put all that on the side and say, I've come to the house of the Lord and we're going to do what? Connect. Number three, number two, I am going to converse. I want to talk to God and I want him to talk to me. And number three, I am going to make a commitment. Praise the Lord. I'm going to make a commitment to what he am going to do. When you went to church, did you have a connection with God? Did you have a conversation? Did you make a commitment? The first commitment we usually give is, hey, if you're in this place, and you don't know that Jesus we're talking about, it's time to make a what? A commitment. It says, Christ, I want to be my God. Covenant that began in the Old Testament, you're my God, I am your child. And you're going to be my God. Forgive me my sins. That's the commitment we normally ask. And still, we do it every day, every Sunday, if you're here. And you say, I do not know Jesus Christ. Some of us have grown up in church. Now, another definition of church. But actually, we've never really understood the concept of making a commitment to giving my life to Christ. Is that true? Yeah, we've grown up in church. I used to go to that church with my grandfather. But also, and knowing what it means to make a commitment of my life to Christ was something else. So if you're really here and you've not understood that part very well, I pray you ask questions and that we can help. But it is as easy as saying, Christ is going to be my God from now on. Forgiving my sins, leading me. And I want to make a commitment to be his follower. It says, how shall a man give his life to Christ? He shall believe in his heart first. And number two, he shall do what? He shall confess with his mouth. We do that. You are confess. We say, repeat these words after me. This is how you commit your life to Christ. But for us who have already done that, been baptized, following God, you've been in church for a long time. Now, do you understand what it means when you wake up and say, I'm going to church? Yes, 
I am going to a place where I'm going to connect with God, talk to him, and in that place, I must be committed. I must be committed to that place because that's where God is. That is the house of the Lord. Now, over the next one or two weeks, we'll dive deeper now into the commitment part. But I wanted you to get this background very well. I don't know. Are we getting it? Yeah. Following? Don't, don't, don't sleep on me. Someone give me an amen. Hey, I, I'm going to separate with corners. I'll, I'll, uh, next Sunday, I'll pick a few people who are going to be my amen corners. I'll have them sit on this side. I'll, if, you, if, you don't give me an, if you don't give me an amen, I'll put you on this side. And then I'll be preaching like this. I'll be looking at you. <laughs> at this side my, hallelujah. Praise God. Uh, so I want to stop there. If I start talking, I will not stop. Praise the Lord. So three things. Have a connection. Brother AJ, you come back. Number two, have uh, a conversation. And what's the third one? Commitment. So we're not here to be cheerleaders. No, no, this is a place where you come. So if you come to church, please, please make an endeavor. Do not say this statement, I was not aware. Well, don't, don't, make, don't, don't be at that statement of, I was not aware. No, no, no. Now you know God is in the place. Even if you turn on your TV on Sunday morning and you're watching from home, God is in your living room. Praise the Lord. Stand up on your feet. Let me pray for you as we finish. Next Sunday, we'll start from there and go into the commitment part. But I want you to understand church. And then how do you belong to a church? And how do you commit to a church? And how does it become your home? And then who a church? We learn things as a church. Uh, you are in a church, you have your spiritual father, you have your shepherd who feeds you. You have a commitment to be discipled, to be taught, to be baptized, and teach others, and pass on these gifts. Praise the Lord. We'll do that next week. We're going to pray, and as we pray, number one, please make a commitment to give your life to Christ. That is the starting point. And then we can dive into reading and studying his word and understanding what his assignment is for you and knowing what you can do in the house of the Lord. Depending on what you call church, you could be a blessing to the church, the building. You could be a blessing to the church, the house of worship, or the local congregation, or the church globally, the church of Christ, wherever you are, you can be a blessing wherever you go. But you understand these things from the local body here where you serve where you tithe where you give praise the lord father in heaven we want to thank you today because you're a good god we want to give you praise for bringing us here to praise and worship your name today as you teach us your word lord we seek your grace we seek understanding we seek wisdom and we ask that the holy spirit will help us Get these words, Lord. Understand the words of life and be able to apply them to our life. But I pray for anyone in this place who does not know you, that they will have a conviction in their heart to want to make you the Lord and Savior of their life. We pray for everything that we are doing in this place, King of Glory. Thank you for your word. Lord, now as it goes in people's hearts, may you water it. Have it, Lord, bless the people and gather us again on Sunday to praise and worship your name. Monday through Saturday, Lord, we pray for our families. We pray for the people who come here, Lord, on Sunday, those who watch online. The Lord, you will bless them with their jobs and work. Lord, with their families, their children. Lord, you bless them, those who go to school, those who are out of school, King of Glory. Lord, you will hear their cries and their prayers. And those who have thanksgiving, you bless them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Someone say amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap. Bless the name of the Lord.
so much for being here. As you walk outside, don't rush home. Say hi to a few people in the fellowship hall. Get to know two, three people. Don't leave by yourself. If you haven't given your offering, the baskets are here. Pick the kids from this place. God bless you. See you next week. Say hi to someone on your way out. And may the good Lord bless you. Hallelujah.